Hey everyone, welcome back to Purple Noon with me, Stephanie Conti, and of course, the love of my life, <laughs> Savannah wow. Lenate. Ooh, cheers. Wow. The crowd goes wild. What did oh, I do to deserve I'm that? Shirt. <laughs> oh, you're flashing you in the corner. Oh. That is the best introduction I'm going to get my <laughs> my entire life. That's I have it. I pop it every single time now. <laughs> Well, howdy, y'all. Uh, how are you? Easter I'm, was just yesterday, so our last video was posted on Easter. So how was your Easter? My Easter was good. You know, just spending it indoors, quarantine style. We we did some, we dyed some eggs. I watched the Bee movie, you know. Oh, an American classic. Yeah, the best. Um, but that was pretty much it. What about you? Um, Let's see. I, I watched the movie we're going to talk about today. Very cool. And there was a lot of sitting, but I can't remember <laughs> what activities I did while sitting. It was a, you know what it is? It's because I've been working out at like 1 a.m. <laughs> nowadays. What do you so, mean? One in the morning? Yeah. For what? I mean, For what? <laughs> just because. I don't get to bed until like 2 or 3. Like during this whole quarantine, I just haven't been able to get to bed until during that time. So I'm like, you know what? I could just work out when like no one is around except like last night my mom like walked by as I was walking out of like my little workout area she was like oh, what are you doing and I'm just drenched in sweat and I'm out of breath and I'm like hi and it was just a very weird interaction <laughs> so does that mess up your sleep schedule you know not for the most part like I'm able to wake up I I'm a I'm a I'm a solid seven hour sleeper like just give me that and I'm good but okay the afternoon naps are a necessity now. Yeah, like, I, I figure. Necessity. Like, what time do you? O'clock, I'm like. Oh, oh three. You're a three o'clock na- napper. I'm usually I'm one thirty. One thirty two napper. By like three o'clock, like because I nothing in my like a perfect day is when I can take a nap at three and wake up at five and someone's like, dinner's ready. And I just walk out and like pretty much I'm so exhausted. I just float to the dinner table and I can just eat. Because that's exactly what happened last night. And it was divine. But you don't get to, because if I nap too late, I feel groggy for the rest of the day. I feel like a zombie. So is no, it- cause I load up on caffeine. Like uh, I, okay. the amount of caffeine, ca- caffeine I have is, it's a little, it, it should be illegal. <laughs> like the amount of caffeine that I have in a day is I not- mean. We could talk about that because I have a little espresso in the morning just to pep me up, but I feel like you have like the little machine now, like or or, or are you like just fancying up your Keurig? I'm fancying up my Keurig. I really wish I had the machine, or I go to I usually go to Starbucks maybe once or Dunkin' once or twice a week, and they have it. So yeah, I noticed without the espresso, I I'm dead. For me, I've been drinking a lot of tea. And like I was in a Zoom call with my family the other day and my aunt, like, cause I drink out of this, I want to say 48 ounce Starbucks cup. Like it's massive. I don't think they even make Starbucks cup that, like this big anymore. Mm-hmm. And I remember drinking it and like my aunt was like, uh, she was afraid. She was like, what the hell is that? Like, <laughs> bigger than my face. I'm like, oh, I'm just drinking tea. And she's like, who drinks that much tea in like a sitting? Like it, it could be a, a big gulp size of green tea. Oh my tea. god! I mean, you could drink worse things. Like you could be drinking Mountain Dew out of that. Just Red so. Bull IV. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh man, I could use some more caffeine in my system. But if anyone hears like any like rattling, that is the ice in my big giant cup rattling. <laughs> oh no! I already have my espresso with me right now, so I'm I'm ready to go. Do you have, like, cups do you have like the little little like a special cup that, like, I have one from my grandma <laughs> that's it oh I bet you wake up like your husband comes down and you're like bonjour <laughs> he gets right, so wait. mad that I want to be French it's really funny <laughs> all right we've dilly-dallied enough so right. today we're gonna be talking about 310 to Yuma not the remake with Christian Bale and Logan Lerman. We're talking about the original that came out in 57. So the synopsis of 310 to Yuma, for those who may not know, is a broke small-time rancher, Dan Evans, is hired by the stagecoach line to put big-time catcher outlaw leader Ben Wade on the 310 to train to Yuma, but Wade's gang tries to free him. 
And let's see who it stars. So it stars Glenn Ford. I'd say Glenn Ford is like the most notable actor in this movie. Not a yeah. lot of other actors I've seen before. But um, the other main character is Van Heflin. It is based off a book by Elmore Leonard. And it was directed by Delmer Davies. And this movie is in the Criterion. Um, I saw it on the Criterion channel, but... Uh, you can also rent it on Prime and everything like that. So, Savannah, before we get into the spoilers and everything, mm-hmm. I would like to hear your review for people who are like, oh, I'm not sure if I should watch this one. What do you say? Do you recommend it? Do you not? Um, so, I just want to say it is a good film. I don't want to just be like, oh, I mean, the thing is, it is a Western, but it's not your traditional Western. If you're looking for something like the good, the bad, and the ugly, this is definitely not it. Um... I would say it's more psychological Western, if that's a genre, but it definitely is more of like a drama, in my opinion. So if you're looking for like a traditional, like, you know, standoff Westerns, this isn't it. Um, I think it's a good film. I I do enjoy uh, the main character. What'd you say his name was Ben Ford in real life? That's not his name, right? Glenn Ford. Glenn, Glenn Ford. Ford. That's right, Glenn Ford. I do enjoy his role the most. He's definitely the most notable. And um, there's a great scene, uh, I guess, in the middle to the end of the movie where it's sort of a psychological standoff where him and this guy are just in the bedroom and um, he's just doing everything he can to convince him to let him go. And it's really, that part is enjoyable. So all in all, I think it's a good film. I think I was just a little disappointed because I expected the traditional Western. So um, that's why I'm kind of saying if you want that, you know, good, the bad, and the ugly feel, don't expect that going into this movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I definitely agree. I enjoyed it a lot because it was so different. Uh, For those, if anyone is like, oh, should I watch this, blah, blah, blah. I wouldn't, if you're looking for an action film... I wouldn't watch it. If you're looking for more of just a a drama that happens to be, you know, set in a western time period, if I don't I don't know if you're looking for that specific niche, <laughs> but I I really enjoyed it. I thought the directing was really good. I thought the acting was good, and I think overall I haven't seen a lot of films in this type of time period in this type of way filmed like this. So I I I do recommend it. I don't think it is for everyone. Yeah. But I don't think if I think I think people would be surprised like this is one of those movies where I think people would be like ah I don't want to watch it and then they watch it they'd be like you know that was actually really good yeah yeah. so okay now spoiler time Mm -hmm. so let's talk about so we we were talking you were talking about Glenn Ford I really liked Glenn Ford I was very very impressed with Glenn Ford in this film yeah, me too. He did he did a great job with his character. Um, almost to where like if he wasn't on screen or if he wasn't talking, I did not care. Not that all the other actors were bad, but he was that like um like every time he came on the screen I got excited. So anytime anybody yeah. else was on the screen, I was just like, Okay, like where where is he? I wanna know where what's he doing now. So he his definitely character. did more exciting, sort of like this enticing role. So he he did great. Definitely. I'd say his character really carries the movie. Yeah. Um, the character Ben Wade is by far that character is my favorite part of the movie. How he's written, the acting, like that character alone could be like in the way that I see it, like if there were other movies starring that character, like kind of like instead of, like if they had like, you know, like a James Bond series, but instead it was like a Ben Wade series. I feel like it could have worked. That would have been really cool. It would have been really, really cool because the character was so well written. And the reason why I think he was well written was because he was a bad guy, but still good at heart. He wasn't the traditional, like, I'll kill everyone, I'll steal your wife, I'll steal your money, I'll get your loot. You know, he wasn't that type of a (laughs) Western villain. He He was real, he was genuine. And I thought even for a film like this, it was still, at least in my opinion, I find um, a lot of Westerns unrealistic. They just seem too grand. It's definitely, yeah, more of towards fantasy. Yeah, like, this one still felt realistic, like, the characters and everything. My only question is, is that I, because I was confused. I was like, when does this story take place? Did you, 
What did you think? So I found I, but it was a little weird. I agree. I was a little confused uh, too. I mean, I I assumed it was like late eighteen hundreds Midwest, but I I couldn't really get a whole like a clear and like I don't know if you noticed, but the other main characters, his sons, talked a little weird for whatever time period it was. It was definitely more modern. (laughs) Yeah, he's like, oh, yeah, our dad is the best. Right, Johnny? Yeah. And I'm just like, isn't this supposed to be, like, Utah in 1890? So that was kind of – that kind of threw me off a little bit. But what what date was it? What what time period was this? So according to the book, it's supposed to be set in the 1880s. So that that would be really, like, my only, like, huh? Because – even though you had like the full Western motif where you had the, this traditional cowboys, you had all of that stuff. It, it still felt pretty modern for the time it was made, which was 57. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That sounds uh, about right. So speaking of the kids that you mentioned, I literally wrote in here, the kids were annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids. They were just not, I don't know if, if it was their fault, but like, like I said, this was supposed to be like New Mexico, Utah, somewhere in the 18, like you said, 80s. They didn't talk like they were from the 1880s. It was just like very 50s. Like you could tell, yeah, like the way they was, talked was from the 50s. Definitely. I, I completely agree. And especially there's one scene where um, the main character has Ben Wade and haircut cu- and ha- haircuffs, handcuffs at their dinner table because he's going to be bringing him to the train and the sons are there oh, yeah. and the wife is there and they're all eating and the kids are like you know my father will kill you blah, blah, blah. and it's like if that was real if the that was the one scene that I was like the scene needs to just get over with because <laughs> so relentless they were like my daddy could kill you and it's like <laughs> meanwhile if there was a situation the father would be like shut up like he <laughs> like Wait, like, but why? We got to talk about the wife too. I wasn't a big fan of the wife. Yeah, no, I felt like so I thought the wife had like that character had a purpose in the film. I truly think that in terms of the way the story played out and in terms of the relation to Ben Wade, her role itself had a purpose, but it wasn't executed properly yeah I agree I just didn't like when it came down to it I was just kind of like I I should care about her I should be interested in what's going on but I'm not yeah and like even like in the end when she pulls up and she's like there when her husband is about to die first of all how did she not she should have been shot like yeah there's like 10 cowboys pointing guns at the front entrance and she just runs in doesn't get her and then you have this criminal in the room just sitting there in handcuffs and she's like please don't take him to the train please and like she's relentless like her kids that's where they get it from she's like please you don't have to you don't have to and he's like I have to I just wish at some point it would have been like the type of thing where the the main character what hold on the main character's name is Dan Evans Mm -hmm. I wish at some point Dan was like go on get like you know like just telling her to get out because the way he was like, nah, just just go home. Just go home. Take care of the kids. I was like, nah, dude, I'd be screaming. Be like, get out. Like, Yeah, like it was very calm for like literally a danger. What well, was supposed to be a dangerous moment and like the peak of the film. Meanwhile, he was so calm. Meanwhile, he had, Dan Evans had been sweating this entire film. <laughs> I don't know. Like I kept looking at it. I was like. This man, they're spraying so much water on this man. This man just keeps sweating. Well, I mean, stop. he was in a room, like, he's very calm when he was, like, in a room with this guy for maybe, what, 30 minutes of the movie. And yeah. um, Glenn Ford is just kind of manipulating him and playing mind games. So, again, it I, I feel like he should have been more on edge just the whole time. Yeah, and I, I also think what could have attributed to that was the soundtrack was good. That intro where it's like, the 310 to Yuma, I was vibing. <laughs> like, when that song hit, I was like, yes. This no, is it definitely really fit with the film. It was so good. I love the song. But um, I wish there was more, almost like that stereotypic 50s, like, soundtrack where it's like, 
like you know you'd have the, like the dramatic actor like turn over and then you hear like a trumpet go Bang! like <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved that type of music for this I felt like it would have you know it, but at the same time like, it would have taken yeah. back the realism of it you know what I feel like would have really really and I I don't say this a lot but do you know what I feel like would have really been great for this movie what if it were shot in color I read somewhere that they chose to shot it in black and white, which is fine. But I feel like with this kind of movie, it would have, I I can't explain why, but I felt like it would have done a lot for the movie if it were shot in color. I think it's also because of the scenic backgrounds. Like the scene, the, the, where they filmed is beautiful. And that's one of the reasons why I like the film. And I definitely think I would appreciate the film a lot more if I was able to see, you know, the full color of everything. Yeah, so I, I do think that was a mistake on their part. I think they should have, because they have the choice. They just didn't do it. Um, yeah. So I That's think because I was I was wondering that too because I was like, this is fifty seven. I think color could have been an option at this point. Yeah. So I felt like you like you said about the music that would have done a lot for the film and color. So mm-hmm. you know, yeah. <laughs> Now, let's um, dive more into the character of Ben Wade, because obviously certain things here and there could have been better. But what really makes this film is that character, Ben Wade. Oh, yeah. So I- let's talk about almost, I want to talk about what makes Ben Wade so unique and different from any Western hero villain. I don't even know what to call him at this point, because at you know, he's definitely not a hero, but at the same time, he's definitely not a villain. What would you call him? He's definitely, I, I mean, the, uh, hmm. I would, in a way, compare him to Tom Ripley, just because he's one of those characters where you, you know, he's bad, but you root for him anyway. And those are the best kind of characters. Um, he's different from the rest of the rest, the Western characters. If you've ever seen like Good, the Bag and the Ugly and um whatever all those Sergio Leone films yeah he's yeah completely different because he's smart and he's witty and he's manipulative in a good way and you don't really see that in a lot of western characters um he kind of plays mind games a lot especially when the scene in the bedroom where it's 20 minutes of him just kind of like taunting this guy so he's definitely like a smart likable villain which I think I, I said it when we were reviewing Purple Noon I think that's one of the best characters you could have in a film Oh yeah, without a doubt, because it's it's so hard to achieve that when writing. And I think that character was made very, very well. Like one of the reasons why I was so fascinated with the character Ben Wade was because here you have this guy who who really isn't like a cold blooded killer. Right. He does he's a hustler. He's a hustler in layman's terms. He does what he can to get money and you know to protect his gang. And But in the end, he has like this speech early on where he's talking to a young woman who he, you know, passionately kisses. But um, one of the things I thought was interesting is that it seemed genuine, even and I knew it was genuine from there, from there on till the end was when he goes, you know, I would just like to like settle down, have a family and do all that. And it seems genuine, like it seems like he wanted that life. And I think wanting that lifestyle was a big it was a big um, motion for this character because in the end he spares, you know, he helps out Dan. And I think it was because Dan had something that he wanted that no other money could attain. And he's like, well, this dude saved my life. If I can't have that life, he's a good guy who should have it. Yeah, I think. And you can definitely see that a little bit in the scene where he's um, at the dinner table with his family and he's actually very polite. And he compliments, like, the house, the wife, the cooking. And you can kind of see, like, oh, like, this is probably something he appreciates. And he, when he leaves the place, he actually tells the wife, he's like, I, I really hope your man can come back home in one piece. You know, like, I, I think that's what makes him so great is because he, he has emotion. He has a want and need for something that in his own mind he can't obtain. He can get all the money in the world. He can get... You know, he could do all of these little schemes and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, he knows that he can't have that. And I think also you were saying he was manipulative. I think even though he was outright manipulative, it was for the most part coming from a good place. 
And that's what I said. I said that he was manipulative in a good way. Like, yeah. And you can kind of see that. Like, that's why I feel like you're not totally against the character. Because even though he's, like, playing mind games and doing all these things, you're kind of just like, you know, I, I hope he wins at the end. Yeah, it, it was. And I did like how usually a lot of Westerns are very, very predictable. At least for me, this film was very unpredictable. I didn't know how it was going to end. Yeah, it definitely has that aspect. It's it's very different for a Western in a good way and for some people in a bad way. In a bad way, yeah. Um, let's now the main character, obviously the main character, uh, Dan. I didn't love him, but I still liked him. I I have the same feelings about him. Like I didn't start really liking him until the end of the movie. Yeah, I, I, I liked his complex, though, of him just being a good, honest man who now has the opportunity, like, with capturing Ben Wade and, you know, with, you know, sending him on the train, he now has this hot opportunity to be, like, the good guy in his own hero story. And I like how even though despite everything, he wants to be that example for his kids, yeah, and I I do like how um, Ben Wade and Dan Evans, I do kind of like how they sort of, um, like there's a parallel there. Mm-hmm. I think they they both, in a way, admire each other, especially towards the end. Um, so I definitely like how the two main characters do like complement each other and work together in that way. And I think they're definitely the stars of the film. Like you meet a lot of people in this movie, but... You're only drawn to them. Oh, yeah. And and I think if you were drawn to anyone else, it would lose what makes this movie so good because the power of this film is within those two characters. Now, yeah. let's talk about action because there was a little bit of action towards the end. I thought it was really well done. Like what I wrote down, I, w- I wrote in all caps, that punch scene was <laughs> great. Yeah. Um, like... There's a scene where um, a man comes in and it's pretty much so uh, a stagecoach driver dies and his brother uh, comes in and wants to talk and pretty much wants to kill Ben Wade instead of taking him onto the train. And so Dan literally just gets up and just socks him in the jaw <laughs> in the jaw. And I, I was like, as soon as I saw it, I was like, whoa, I had to rewind it because it looked pretty, you know, pretty realistic. No, in terms of the act, like the action they did have, it was well done, especially for that time period, because you get a lot of like, not that the action was bad back then, but sometimes you can tell when it's a fake punch or something like that. I thought it was really well done. But again, I think my issue was, and this is totally my fault, I was expecting more. So Mm -hmm. with the little they did have, I was just kind of like, oh, it's over. That was it. So um. In terms of the action we do get, it's very, very well done. I Especially for the time period. It's very good. I agree. I was expecting more, too. Um, because it's a Western. It, it, it's just what you expect from that genre. So I could see that. And I, I definitely was expecting some grand, elaborate, you know, oh, like, <laughs> showdown. And... Now, to some people who will watch it, that will be a huge disappointment. But I'm someone who like likes psych- psychological thrillers. No, and no, yeah. Things like that. So for me, I was like, ooh, this is different. I really enjoyed this. But if you're looking for like the expendables of the 50s, this ain't it. No, no. I, I think I really like that the film was psychological. I just wish it did bring more of the action into it. Because I feel like if the if the movie had both, it would be fantastic but but because it lacks um the action I do think that's where like they lose a lot of its audience I agree I agree and I think also it's an hour and a half film I think it's for the most part good pacing it's just that beginning the beginning was slow so slow slow I fell asleep twice (laughs) like I had I to was pause not it. Expecting to like it, yeah. I had to pause it. I took a nap, and then I had to finish it a few hours later. But then, so I did that. I paused it, took a nap twice, twice because I did it on separate days. I watched the first half an hour, paused it, took a nap, wasn't able to finish it that day. 
So I went back, I restarted it, paused it at the same exact point, took a nap, <laughs> came back, but finished it. But it, it's definitely hard because like, it does get pretty good in the middle of the film. It's just that first half an hour, where you're just like, where is this going? They've been doing the same thing for 15 minutes. So it took me like a good three hours to finish the movie because I was just kind of like, oh, I don't know what we're going to talk about on this podcast. This is the whole movie, but yeah, um, like it, it does get good. Minutes, the first five minutes where Ben Wade kills the stagecoach driver. Is yeah, very well done it's you awesome. Because expecting him to not only shoot the stagecoach driver, but he shot one of his own men. So you were like, what? Like, that's his dude. Like, what? Yeah, but yeah. after that, it trails off into this buildup. Now, this buildup, in my opinion, doesn't ruin the film. It does hinder it, like this, like slow pace, and like a little bit, kind of like after the first five minutes, but before the hour mark. It, that forty-five minute bracket is yeah. kind of just a little. It's a little steep climb. It's unnecessary. It, like if we're gonna be honest, it's a little unnecessary. Like we didn't need everything in those. What was it? Thirty minutes. We didn't really need everything. Um. I think, I think they could have me, cut certain was, things. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, like, I was going to say, like, I, exactly what you were going to talk about. They could have cut certain things. Like, I like the scene with Ben Wade talking to the girl and kind of swooning this girl over because we got a glimpse into his life. It was when it switched over to Dan, that's when I felt the sluggishness of the storyline occur mm. because there was no climb of ter- in terms of, like, character development for Dan until the end. Yeah, I I definitely agree. It was more of Dan's plot that was just kind of sluggish. I think with older movies, there 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 are quite a few that don't aren't slow in my opinion, but there's a lot that have those slow moments just because of the time. Um like the 50s, the 60s, and even some of the movies in the 70s, like you're going to get those sort of like slow um scenes. So I try to be fair, but I do feel like this was a little unnecessary. And I think if if people are going to, like, are interested, okay, let me watch this as a Western, you could lose people just in the 10 to 45-minute range just because they're like, nothing has happened. I agree. And, that, and that's the sad thing about this because I was happy because at first I was like, I don't think I'm going to like this movie. It's just <laughs> too slow. But when we started to see Ben and Dan interact with each other, that's when it picked up. That's when I was like, oh, like this is why this film is in the criterion. This is why this right. film is like great reviews. And I think it's sad because like nowadays, I don't think a lot of people would have, and this is just from people who I know, I don't think a lot of people would have the attention span, sadly, for to, you know, deal with that slow half an hour before progressing into you know the meat of the story that was so so good totally agree I don't think a lot of people our age would give this movie a chance and I'm gonna be honest like if I didn't have to review this for the film I mean our podcast I don't know if I would have finished the movie just because it would have lost me that it's not a traditional there was a lot of things that it would have lost me out but I am happy that like I did finish and see the that bedroom scene that was just really really great so if you guys are listening um definitely watch the movie and finish it because you won't regret it just try to get through that (laughs) 10 to 45 minute range yeah and I I, like you said I think that is very very common because even like I remember feeling that way during the good bad and the ugly yeah and that's a long movie that's like two and a half three hours that's long that's long like really like the only thing uh like with the good the bad and the ugly that I remember from seeing is you know the final scene you know that whole setup I don't remember the beginning and this and that but at least with this film with this western um I think I didn't remember the good and the bad and the ugly that much because all the action that took place in the beginning and the middle it it didn't adhere it didn't stick to my brain whereas this the whole psychological like this is a movie I can definitely see myself talking about in five years and being like oh yeah I recommend that movie like and this is why yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I'm trying to think. It, have you ever seen, I'm trying to think, uh, other, like, a uh, High Noon? I think High Noon would probably be my favorite with Grace no, Kelly. I have not seen, I have not seen High Moon. I'm a, I'm a little newbie to the Western world. 
No, I haven't seen all of them. I'm I'm just trying to f- remember like the ones I've have seen because uh once a time in the pot once upon a time in the west was good. I haven't seen a lot. I'm just trying to figure out what I could compare it to and I don't think I can really compare it to anything because like I said a lot of westerns don't have that psychological or even like smartness to it. A lot of it is just standoffs and revenge and I need to get my gold, you know. The only thing I could actually compare it to is um it's another Criterion, and it's a, a Marlon Brando film, and it was the only film that he ever directed. And hmm. now I haven't, and I'm not doing a full review on this right now because I haven't seen the movie in full. But from what I know about the movie, I could compare it and put it in the same category with 310 to Yuma because both of them have these very different leads. Like they're not your traditional hero slash villain. Oh. I think actually one, it's called One Eye Jacks. I oh, I've never. Hmm. Okay, it, yeah, it's his only directorial, and it's done very well because he had Stanley Kubrick's help on it. Stanley wow. Kubrick taught him how to direct, so it's done very well. And it just added. It never got big because I think it just advertising didn't work well for it, and but it it became kind of like this cult classic western because you have. Because Marlon Brando plays a bad guy, and he's the main center around the story. But he's like a bad guy with a with a tender heart, just just looking to settle down. And I I just love, I love a story that has a male character with complexity. Because I feel like a lot of action films today kind of just dumb down the emotions of a man. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I I agree. We don't see a lot of heart in action films anymore. And you don't see a lot of complexity either. Like, I mean, we don't really get a lot of quality action films anymore, either, if you think about it. Last one, it was Big Trouble in Little China. Changed my mind. Like, (laughs) seriously? We're going to have to do a review on that, because I'm not trying to, like, I've heard a lot of people think that movie sucks. And I I like the movie, because my dad's a really big fan. But a lot of people are like, that is, like, the cheesiest 80s movie ever. So we have to do a review on why we like that film. Okay, okay, yeah, because I could go off for another 40 <laughs> minutes just talking about Big Trouble in Little China. But yeah, like, I think, like, movies like 310 to Yuna, Big Trouble in Little China, one Eye Jacks and stuff, they work so well because they make male characters vulnerable. And that is a lot of things that we don't see. And not, like, in an Avengers way where they become vulnerable physically. That's what I think is different between action films like this and action films like superhero movies. Because oh, they just show, Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> and and I'm not saying that I don't like Marvel movies. No, I don't but... either. But it's definitely... I mean, we could do a podcast on it. Because I don't... I, I enjoy them, but in a different way. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, like... It, it's just, for me, I've always found that most... Not all. Most superhero movies leave the, the male characters vulnerable physically, not mentally. And if it is mentally, it's not deep. It's not deep. Yeah. Like, you know, like you have Spider-Man where it's like every villain is like, ha, Uncle Ben died. <laughs> <laughs> and then you saw Spider-Man's just sobbing. Which, oh my I mean, God. It, it just, it doesn't go. That's kind of true because Batman is the same way. Like, ha, I killed your parents. Your parents died. <laughs> <laughs> Shot your parents in an alley. Yeah, you're right. I never thought of it that way because, yeah, you know, because every superhero does have that tragic story and like somebody will bring it up and it, there's no vulnerability. They'll just get mad. Whereas with 310 to Yuma, Ben Wade is a great example of vulnerability because you see him teeter between, you know, do I stay the bad guy? Do I stay the stoic, you know, gang leader? Or do I let this guy go? Like, because I have the choice here. And you kind of see him in his own mind. He doesn't say it. But you can see as this character progresses, him switching back and forth. And that's what I think is vulnerable about Mm. him and Mm -hmm. vulnerable and honorable um I'm just always I'm a sucker for a guy with emotion what can I say (laughs) (laughs) no I think I think that's definitely a strength of the character and it's what makes this movie different yeah like anytime like I see like if there's an action hero or some type of big movie but like with a little like with a sensitive male character I'm like yes (laughs) yes Because I just, it adds, when you, any, for, even if it's male or female, when you allow a character 
to completely be vulnerable on the screen and just you can it feels realistic and you become more invested in that character like if ben wade was like i'm just here to kill i'd be like i don't like this dude like (laughs) one track mine i don't like it. but if he (laughs) were to be killed i would have been sad i would have been like oh yeah like i was i was like i don't know where this is gonna go but i don't want him to die like i really wish they could like I don't know if Elmore Leonard, the writer of this book, has made more books uh, involving this character, but I hope so, because it's a very, very, very well-written character. Yeah, I agree. Um, I hope he has his little... One of the best things, though, is that when he's on the train and, you know, um, Dan, Dan is like, why did you save me? Like, you could have let your men kill me, but why didn't? He's like, no, you should go home to your family. Plus, I've broken out of Yuma before. I'll be back. Like... Just the nonchalant, like, eh, no big deal. It's not worth the death over. Yeah, that was I really enjoyed. cool. Um, And the last thing I'll say is this was a pretty, I think at, for its time, it was a, you know, with it being the category, the Western, it didn't feel like a box office for that time, which I like. It didn't feel like the studio Western. No, d- definitely not. Definitely not, because studio and westerns were all the same back then. Huge productions, like 30 people on the screen at once. Every, there's a, a gun always going off, and I liked how, you know, it's kind of like an indie western, and I, I thought it worked very, very well. And you know Overall, what I noticed? Yeah, do you know up? what I noticed? With westerns, you always have the attractive, like, the really, really attractive, like, lead male, usually. And the really, really attractive um, lead woman. And Mm -hmm. there was a really pretty girl, the one that uh, Ben Ford does talk to. But for the most part, you don't really get that. Not that they're ugly, but they're definitely not, like, heartthrobs either. So I thought that was an interesting play. Yeah, like, it's – I I do appreciate that because – when you have it's more realistic that, it's definitely more yes, realistic yeah yes because it's like I don't believe a story where someone you know let's say we're talking about when I drags if it was this huge studio box office where it's like I that Marlon Brando is talking to you know Vivian Lee or something like that like these are two ridiculously gorgeous looking people I don't believe it this ain't real life yeah they didn't look like that back then <laughs> but at least with this one like it's like oh and like I liked how they didn't go for like the two young cowboys, you know, like, yeah. kind of like early Clint Eastwood. They they took two old geezers and ma- like made a psychological thriller out of it, and it's that is so hard to do. I don't think anyone could have done it as good as this director did. Yeah, I agree. They took two older men, which wasn't really popular at the time. In my, I think, right? Like they weren't a lot of like, unless it was no. a specific drama or anything. I don't remember seeing a lot of like movies from the fifties where it's like besides maybe vertigo where there's an older man uh um, yeah no they were especially in western in casting the the good looking lead yeah so i i did appreciate that about the film because it, it does add some realism to the film mm-hmm. and so I, I i don't know like i haven't seen the the remake because they did remake this with christian bale and logan lerman and i think it was butler Not so butler I think Look no, that, it was it looks like Gerard Butler. I think it was Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe, thank you. And then he plays uh, Ben Ford's character, and then Christian Bale plays um, the other male lead. So I don't know. I I see Christian Bale doing well, but I don't know how I feel about Russell Crowe playing Ben Ford's character because I think there has to be a certain um, charm and wit to it. And not that Russell Crowe's a bad actor. I actually enjoy his films a lot. I just don't know. I, I could see that. And then I also, like, was curious because you know, an actor who I like, Logan Lerman, is in it. And I was like, what character would he play? He's not playing the blonde, you know, you know hype man. He was very young because that movie came out, what, 15, 12, something? Like, <laughs> Don't tell me he played one of the annoying kids. I think he played oh, his... Oh, you could kill him? <laughs> I think he played the son because Logan Lerman isn't that old. Like, he's in his uh, late 20s. So if, if this movie came out, like... 15 years ago he would have been a teenager well maybe it's something we have to go over and maybe we have to do a quick comparison i would i probably am going to watch the film um because i'll uh 
I'll watch the next movie. We'll announce it at the end of this tomorrow. And then this weekend, I probably will have time to watch the remake. So I'll let you know how I like it. You know what? Let's just put it out in the universe. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it on a podcast. It's just there. We'll we'll get to it when we can. Yeah. We'll, we'll deviate from our schedule at one point. Yeah, and we'll yeah, talk yeah. about we'll, we'll, the remake 310 to Yuma and how it compares to the we'll, old one. I we'll, think it's fun. Yeah. I think it's fun to do. We'll squeeze it in. We'll squeeze it in for you guys. All right. So... The next time you hear us, which will be on Sunday, the next time you hear us, we're going to be talking about a movie that I really like. That's I'm Savannah's nervous. <laughs> I'm because nervous. it is by one of my favorite directors, Lars von Trier. Mm. It's not Antichrist. It's not Nymphomania, n- 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 Nymphomaniac. We're going with an oldie but a goodie, Europa. And I'm excited because I love this movie and I've never met anyone else who's seen this movie before. So I can't wait to talk about it. I'm, I'm excited. Um, Lars Van Tra- scares me, just to be completely honest. <laughs> like after watching um, The House That Jack Built, which we'll have to talk about at some point. Um, and then just watching reviews on his other films like Nymphomaniac and Dancer in the Dark, I believe, was one with B- mm-hmm. Bjorn. Um, the Icelandic Bjork. Bjork is that how you say her name Bjork okay Bjork um his plots are definitely very scary and he he films a lot of um uncomfortable movies so yes I'm excited because this one does seem a little bit different from what he has made it seems a lot more toned down in terms of plot and- so I am excited. I'm just a little like, oof, Lars von Tr- The name is just getting under my skin. So uh, I'm excited. I will definitely tell you guys my honest opinion. So yeah, so tune in next time on Sunday when we're going to be talking about Europa. Not Europa Europa, just Europa. So uh, hope you guys enjoyed what we had to say about 310 to Yuma. And we will see you guys again soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.